This series, The Shock of the New, is about an old subject, almost a hundred years old. The art of our own century, modernism. The key word of the new century was modernity. Modernity meant believing in technology and not craft, in human perfectibility, not original sin, and above all, in a ceaseless consumption of things and the images of things. If you were a Parisian alive in 1890 and you wanted to show a visitor what modernity meant, you pointed to this structure, the tallest man-made object on earth, the Tower of Babel of the new machine age. Since the Great Exhibition of 1851 in London, the big powers of Europe had taken to holding world's fairs to show off their industrial strength. Paris scheduled one for 1889, the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. This was its emblem, a huge act of propaganda designed not by an architect, but by an engineer, Gustave Eiffel. Tower was the static totem of the cult of dynamism, a colossus planted with spread legs in the middle of Paris. Its shape alluded to the human body and to the colossi of the past. It was the guardian of the future. It summed up what technological progress meant to the men who ran Europe at the end of the 19th century, the promise of unlimited control over the world and its wealth. The most visible sign of the future was the automobile, and this is the first public sculpture ever set up in its praise. It commemorates the great road race of 1895 from Paris to Bordeaux and back, which was won by an engineer named Emile Levasseur in the car that he designed and built himself, the Ponhar Levasseur 5. It could do about the same speed as a jumping frog, but not very much more. Nevertheless, Levasseur's victory was of tremendous social consequence because it persuaded Europeans, both manufacturers and public alike, that the future of road transport lay with the internal combustion engine and not, as many had thought before, with either electricity or steam. In all justice, there ought to be a replica of this thing set up in every oil port from the Persian Gulf to Houston. But if it looks somewhat ludicrous to us as sculpture today, that's because of difficulties between sculpture and the new convention of the machine. A stone car. The idea seems surrealist to a modern eye. It's simply incongruous. Stone is immobile, mineral, brittle, cold. Cars are fast, metallic, elastic, warm. A human body is warm too, but we don't think of statues as stone men because we're used to the conventions of representing flesh with stone. There were no such conventions for depicting machinery. It was too new. But the conditions of seeing were also starting to change, and the Eiffel Tower stood for that too. What counted was not so much the view of the tower from the ground, it was seeing the ground from the tower. Nobody except a few men in balloons had ever seen this before. There were individual pilots who saw the sight from their planes, but it was the Eiffel Tower that gave a mass audience a chance to see what you and I take for granted every time we fly. The earth on which we live seen flat as pattern from above. The Eiffel Tower was therefore a pivot in human consciousness, and that view of the city seen by those hundreds of thousands of visitors was as significant in 1889 as the sight of the earth from the moon 
would be 80 years later. Through the medium of technology, culture was reinventing itself everywhere. In 1877, Thomas Alva Edison came up with the most radical extension of cultural memory since the printed book. He invented sound recording. The first human utterance ever retrieved. I designed my original tin foil phonograph in cylinder form and gave it to my faithful John Crusey to make. He made fun of it. I was almost as surprised as he was when the first model introduced Murray Howe, the little lad, which I started into it. Police was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. In 1879, Edison invented the incandescent filament bowl. The fairy electricity was now let loose upon the world. Thus amazing people who had up to now depended upon gas and whale oil to see at night. In 1895, the Lumiere brothers made the images of a magic lantern move. They invented the movie camera and the projector. In 1898, Marie Curie discovered radium. In 1901, Guglielmo Marconi sent the first transatlantic radio message along the Virgin Airwaves from Cornwall to the east coast of America. In 1903, two home inventors, Wilbur and Orville Wright, observed the wind, put wings on a bicycle, scrambled into it, started their motor, and the stupefaction of the world took off, achieving man's first powered flight in a heavier-than-air machine. In 1905, an obscure physicist named Albert Einstein developed the special theory of relativity, the basis of the largest change in man's view of the universe since Isaac Newton. He ushered in the nuclear age with one formula. E is equal mc square, in which energy is set equal to mass, multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy. Very few people understood it, and nobody could foresee its implications. By 1913, Henry Ford had so developed the idea of mass production that the car, running on Mr. Dunlop's pneumatic tires, ceased to be a toy for the rich and became every man's chariot. The Wright brothers had only got a few yards off the ground, but within six years, a French aviator named Louis Blériot managed to pilot his buzzing wooden dragonfly from one country to another, from France to England, across the vast cultural divide of the English Channel. In 1913, the French writer Charles Peguy remarked, The world has changed less since the time of Jesus Christ than it has in the last 30 years. He was right, and it was a widespread feeling. For the essence of the early modernist experience was not the specific inventions. Most people weren't affected by a prototype in a lab or an equation on a blackboard. Not yet. No, the important thing was the sense of an accelerated rate of change in all areas of human discourse. It provided the feeling of an approaching millennium, a new order of things, as the 19th century clicked over into the 20th, the end of one kind of history and the start of another. Soon after Blériot flew the channel, his little monoplane was carried in public procession through the streets of Paris and installed in a church for all the world like the relic of an archangel and such was the early apotheosis of the machine. But to have a cult does not mean that the images automatically follow. The changes in man's view of himself and the world between 1880 and 1914 were so far reaching that they produced as many problems for artists as they did stimuli. For instance, how could you make paintings that would reflect the immense shifts in consciousness that this changed technological landscape implied? How could you produce a parallel dynamism to the machine age without falling into the elementary trap of just becoming a machine illustrator? 
and above all how by shoving around on a canvas sticky stuff like paint on a static surface could you produce a convincing record of process and transformation. Now the first artists to come up with a sketch for an answer to this were the Cubists. Since the Renaissance almost all painting had obeyed a convention. It was that of one point perspective. Perspective was a geometrical means for producing an illusion of reality, for showing things in space in their right sizes and positions. Nevertheless, it was an abstraction. It was a view seen by a motionless, one-eyed person, clearly detached from what he sees. Perspective gathers the visual facts and it stabilizes them. It makes a god of the spectator who becomes the person on whom the whole world converges, the unmoved onlooker. Cubism argued that reality includes the painter's efforts to perceive it. Both the viewer and the view are part of the same field. The first artist to explore this idea and finally to base his work on it was Paul Cezanne. The question of why the paintings that Cezanne made in his old age were to have such a vast effect upon the history of art can't be answered in terms of style. What they proposed was more radical than style. It was a fundamental argument about the way that we actually see. He wants to show the process of seeing, not just the results. And he takes you through this process. You share his hesitations about the position of a trunk or a branch or the final shape of a mountain and the trees in front of it. The statement, this is what I see, becomes replaced by a question, is this what I see? Relativity is all. The idea that doubt can be heroic if it is locked into a structure as grand as the paintings of Cezanne's old age, that is one of the keys of our century and a touchstone of modernism itself. Cubism would bring it to an extreme. The idea began here at 13 Rue Ravignon in Paris in 1907 in a warren of cheap artist studios called the Bateau Lavoir or Laundry Boat. It was set off by a Spaniard, Pablo Picasso, then aged 26. Picasso's partner in inventing Cubism was a slightly younger and rather more conservative Frenchman, Georges Braque. In the public eye, these men didn't exist. The audience for their paintings might have been a dozen people, and this meant that they were free, as researchers in some very obscure area of science are free. Nobody cared enough to interfere. They wanted to paint the fact that our knowledge of an object is made up of all possible views of it, top, sides, front, back. They wanted to compress this inspection, which takes time, into one moment, one synthesized view. One of their experimental materials was the art of other cultures, oceanic and African, as despised as they then were. At the time, there were no museums of tribal art like this one to consult. One of the mild ironies of Cubism is the extent to which it was helped by the French Empire in Africa. Picasso and Braque both owned African carvings, but they had no anthropological interest in them at all. They didn't care about their ritual uses. They knew nothing about their original tribal meanings or about the societies out of which they came. They simply used them formally, and in that regard, Cubism was like a small parody of the imperial model. The masks were simply raw material from the darkest Congo, like copper or palm oil. And Picasso's use of them was, in effect, a kind of cultural plunder. But then, why use African art at all? The Cubists were just about the first artists to even think of doing so. 130 years before, when Benjamin West admired the cloths and the clubs and the carvings that had come back from the Pacific with Captain Cook, no royal academicians then took the cue and started painting Tahitian style. When Picasso started to produce what was in effect white art in blackface, he was saying what no 18th century painter would ever have imagined the same self saying. He was proposing that the tradition of the human figure, which had served Western art so well over the preceding centuries, had at last run out, and that in order to renew its vitality, you had to look elsewhere, in effect, to look to those folks in Africa with rhythm. 
This was not so much a gesture of homage in the direction of the blacks, though, as it was a successful raid on them by the whites. What Picasso did care about was the formal vitality of the carvings, the freedom to distort. And something else, they were, to him, in the most literal sense, emblems of savagery, of violence transferred into the sphere of culture. But this did produce the painting whose shock value provoked cubism, and this was Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. <laughs> No painting ever looked more convulsive, and none signalled a faster change in the history of art. And yet, it was anchored in the tradition of the new. Picasso began it the year Cezanne died, and its nearest ancestor was Cezanne's bathers. It also descends from Picasso's Spanish heritage. Those unstable, twisting bodies are like El Greco, and so is the angular, harshly lit space. The five nudes are chopped into planes and arcs as though the brush were a butcher knife. Their mass is breaking up and even today you think of dismemberment. Even the melon looks like a weapon. The space is flattened like a squashed box, as solid as the figures. And in the midst of all this violent abstraction, the masks. The three on the left are derived from archaic Spanish sculpture. the two on the right from African carvings. All of them staring with the hypnotic fixity that Picasso would always give to the eye. Picasso never liked the title. He called his painting the Avignon Brothel because there had been a whorehouse on the Carrere d'Avignon or Avignon Street in Barcelona when he was a student. His original idea was to paint an allegory of venereal disease called The Wages of Sin. A man carousing in a brothel and another man coming in at the left with what was going to be a skull, that very Spanish reminder of mortality. In the final painting, though, only the nudes are left, archaic and aggressive, and their cult is the fear of women. No painter ever put his anxiety about castration more plainly than Picasso did here, and the combination of form and subject was alarming to the few people who saw Les Demoiselles. Georges Braque was horrified by its ugliness and intensity, but he painted a relatively timid and laborious response to it, and from then on, Braque and Picasso would be locked in a partnership of questions and responses, roped together like mountaineers, as Braque memorably said. Picasso cleared the ground for Cubism, but it was Georges Braque who, over the next two years, 1908 and 1909, did the most to develop its vocabulary. They say the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Now, Picasso was the fox. He was the virtuoso. Braque was the hedgehog, and the one big thing that he knew was Cezanne, with whom he identified to the point of obsession. He admired Cezanne, as he put it, for sweeping painting clear of the idea of mastery. He loved his doubt, his doggedness, his concentration, his lack of eloquence. Well, Braque wanted to see if Cezanne's way of building a painting, that fusing of little tilted facets, that solidity of structure and ambiguity of reading, could be pushed further, which he did with the landscapes he painted in two places where Cezanne himself had worked. First at Lestac in the south of France in 1908. The Estac paintings began as almost straight Cezanne. This is one view that Braque looked at that summer. This is what he made of it. Every scrap of detail edited out, prisms, triangles. Yet the shading no longer gives you a feeling of solidity. Some of the corners could either be sticking out of the picture or pointing back into it. In the summer of 1909, Braque went painting closer to Paris in a village in the Seine Valley called La Roche-Guillon. The valley's lined with chalk cliffs and there's a castle built into them. 
It belongs to the La Rochefoucauld family, and Braque made it his motif, that jumble of planes and gables and spires stacked up against the cliff. Moreover, on the top, there's a 13th century Norman tower. And it was in ruins when Braque saw it, as it is today, but it gave him another part of his motif, a big strong cylinder on top. So there was this, from his point of view, nice rhyme between the actual forms of the landscape and the shapes that he wanted to put in a painting. Between those planes ascending the cliff, going in and out, pressed forward by the cliff itself, which blocked off the perspective. This was what he painted. He then scrambled up the chalk bluff to the side and looked at the castle from an angle which gave him an even more complicated geometry of gables and turrets coming down into the town. So would Braque have invented cubism on his own? Probably, but it would have lacked the power that Picasso brought to it. This was his unequalled ability to realise form, to make you feel the shape and the weight and the silence of things. This is the plastic power of a sculptor, but in paint. And distorted as they are, you're made to feel them so strongly that you can imagine them picked off the canvas in three dimensions. For the moment, Picasso's portraits, like this one of the deal of Vollard, were still recognisable. But any reality was bound to alter once it was thrust into the shifting, abstract space that he and Braque had invented. By 1911, Picasso and Braque were painting like Siamese twins. This painting of a guitarist is by Braque. This one, of another guitarist, is by Picasso. Their paintings of this period are virtually indistinguishable except for fine differences of handwriting. Without the labels on the gallery wall, you could hardly guess which painting is by which of the two painters. All this break up and shuffling. Nobody had ever painted more baffling images. Nothing is constant. Every shape is a report on multiple meanings. It's an attempt to set out the world as a field of shifting relationships that include the onlooker. They were trying to paint process. Braque and Picasso were not mathematicians, and certainly they weren't philosophers. But their art was part of the same great tide of modernist thought that included Einstein and the philosopher Alfred Whitehead. The misconception which has haunted philosophic literature throughout the centuries is the notion of independent existence. There is no such mode of existence. Every entity is only to be understood in terms of the way in which it is interwoven with the rest of the universe. As Gertrude Stein remembered it, the cubist game of hide and seek with reality fed back into the world in odd ways. The first year of the war, Picasso and myself were walking down the boulevard Raspail. All of a sudden, down the street came some big cannon, the first any of us had seen painted, that is, camouflaged. Pablo stopped, he was spellbound. C'est nous qui avons fait ça, he said. It is we that have created that. 
And he was right. He had. Camouflage was Cubism at war. And ever since, the Cubists' delight in ambiguity, what is seen and not seen, has had its ominously practical uses. Picasso's next step was to stick a piece of oilcloth to one of his still lives. It was printed with a design of chair caning, and so collage began. Collage, which simply means gluing, was a way of strengthening the link between Cubism and the real world. It gave Picasso and Braque bigger and bolder shapes to play with, and these shapes were real things, emblems of the industrial present, newspapers, packets, wallpaper, and the fake wood graining that Braque had learned to do when he was an apprentice house painter in Normandy. They were recoiling from the abstractness of those pictures of 1911, and in that they were joined by the third musketeer, a more classical artist than either of them, Juan Gris. In him, Cubism found a mind of the coolest analytical weight. To Gris, the world of cheap mass production and reproduction was a sort of Arcadia, a pastoral landscape, as it was to Apollinaire. You read handbills, catalogues, posters that shout out loud, Here's this morning's poetry. And for prose, you've got the newspapers. Sixpenny detective novels full of cop stories. Biographies of big shots, a thousand different titles. Lettering on billboards and walls. Door plates and posters squawk like parrots. Cubist Paris is receding now. But it's still there, the glass and iron city of small arcades, the marble city of cafe tables, the place of zinc bars, dominoes, dirty chessboards, crumpled newspaper, the brown city of old paint and pipes and panelling, history to us now, but once the landscape of the modernist dream. The fourth major cubist was Fernand Léger. He wanted to make a public style of cubism, a popular art, images of the machine age for the man in the street. He was the son of a Normandy farmer, an instinctive socialist who became a practicing one in the trenches of World War I. I found myself on a level with the whole of the French people. My new companions in the engineer corps were miners, navvies, workers in metal and wood. Among these I discovered the French people. At the same time I was dazzled by the breach of a 75 millimetre gun which was standing uncovered in the sunlight. The magic of light on white metal. Metal or flesh, it made no difference. 
Leger painted the body as though it were made of interchangeable parts like machinery. The soldiers' insignia on these card-playing robots might as well be factory brands. To him, society as machine meant harmony, an end to loneliness. The Three Women, one of the paintings that best expresses this, is among the great didactic images of French classicism. This philosophical harem is Leger's vision of human relationships working as smoothly as a clock, with the binding energy of desire transformed into rhymes of shape. There were some artists to whom this mechanical age was much more than a context and very much more than a pretext. They wanted to explore its characteristic images of light, structure and dynamism as subjects in their work. Robert Delaunay was crazy about the Eiffel Tower. He thought of it as a new Tower of Babel, emitting a clamour of tongues from the first radio system installed on it in 1909. He must have painted it 30 times, the first time for his Russian wife and fellow painter, Sonia. Light seen through structure. It became a theme, his fundamental image of modernity, that great grid rising over Paris with the sky reeling through it. Delaunay also painted windows, landscapes of Paris seen as though through a prism, and Apollinaire illustrated them with words. Raise the blind and see how the window opens. If hands could weave light, this was done by spiders. Beauty, pallor, unfathomable indigos. From the red to the green, all the yellow dyes. Paris, Vancouver, Yer, Maintenon, New York, and the West Indies. The window opens like an orange, the beautiful fruit of light. Whereas Leger thought the core of modernism was structure, the Delaunays believed it was light, pure energy, flooding the world. Its emblem was the disc. This was the basic unit of Robert's grand allegory of newness, the homage to Blériot, the great constructor, as he called the pilot.
the effects of today's museums with their lovely white walls and their feeling of a perpetual presence is to make art seem newer than it actually is. You have to pinch yourself to remember that when the paint was fresh on those cubist Picassos and Delaunays, people wore hobble skirts and they rode around in machines like this one, sitting up front of the driver. And that feeling of disjuncture, the sense of the oldness of modern art, becomes acute when you reflect upon the only art movement that came out of Italy in the 20th century. Futurism was the invention of Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, part lyrical genius, part organ grinder, and part fascist demagogue, and by his own account, the most modern man in his own country. When right-minded people between the wars thought of modern artists as subversive buffoons, their image was formed by Marinetti. He was a genius of publicity, and he used every trick to get it for himself and for the futurist painters. Posters, leaflets, demos, meetings. He even invented the happening, montage in real time, with poems and declamations, paintings and music, all on stage at once. He took his roadshow everywhere, even to Russia. Marinetti called himself the caffeine of Europe. He was the first international agent provocateur that modern art had. The name futurism was a brilliant choice, challenging but vague, but the central idea that Marinetti trumpeted forth in the first futurist manifesto in 1909 was that the machine had created a new class of visionaries, himself and anyone who cared to join him. For Marinetti and his group, all the old ideas about art and artists were about to be blown off the cultural map. You needed to come from a technologically backward country to love the future as passionately as Marinetti did. Machinery was power. It was freedom from historical restraint. Manifesto of Futurism. One, we intend to sing the love of danger, the habit of energy and fearlessness. We affirm that the world's magnificence has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing car whose hood is adorned with great pipes like serpents of explosive breath. A roaring car that seems to run on shrapnel is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. We want to hymn the man at the wheel who hurls the lance of his spirit across the earth along the circle of its orbit. But we want no part of it, the past. We, the young and strong futurists. So let them come. The gay incendiaries with charred fingers. Here they are, here they are, come on. Set fire to the library shelves. Turn aside the canals to flood the museums. Oh, the joy of seeing the glorious old canvases bobbing adrift on those waters, discoloured and shredded. Take up your pickaxes, your axes and hammers, and wreck, wreck, wreck the venerable cities pitilessly.
In their art, they set out to find an equivalent for the speed and the movement that they worshipped in their cars. They kept issuing manifestos, operatic love letters to industry and hymns to the beauty of its products. The artists who gathered round Marinetti before the First World War were the core of the futurist group and some of them would soon be dead. The most gifted of them, Umberto Boccioni, fell off his horse and was killed in 1916 in the war which he and Marinetti had praised as the hygiene of civilization. But in the meantime, he had produced some extraordinary images, none more so than the City Rises, his peon of joy to industry and heavy construction, with its straining cables and draft horses and plunging figures. But the problem was how to represent movement. For that, the futurists resorted to photography, especially the sequential photographs published by the French pioneer Etienne Jules Marais. By giving you the successive positions of a figure on one plate, these photos introduced time into space. The body left its own memory in the air. 400 years before, Leonardo had bought birds in the Florentine market and let them go to study the beat of their wings for a few seconds. Now the cameras of Marais and Edward Mybridge could describe this world of unseen movement. Some of Giacomo Balla's paintings were almost transcriptions of their photographs. This one, for instance, is entitled Swifts, Paths of Movement and Dynamic Sequences. Dynamism of a dog on a leash was a glimpse of boulevard life with a fashionable lady, or at any rate her feet, trotting her dachshund, a low-slung modern animal, the sports car of the dog world, along the pavement. Watching a virtuoso's rapid fingers gave Bala the clue for rhythms of a violinist. As well as movement, they wanted to paint noise. This painting of Boccioni's is called The Noise of the Street Penetrates the House. Futurism loved any noise that was dissonant, loud, or made by a machine. The most ambitious effort to paint equivalence for sound and movement was Gino Severini's picture of a cabaret in Paris where he and the Cubists used to go, the Bal Tabarin. Like them, Severini loved common popular entertainment. But not every artist had that kind of straightforward optimism about the machine. There were some that viewed it with uh, more irony and detachment, more like voyeurs than participants, because they perceived that the thing was more than a tool, more than simply an extension of the manufacturing self. Having been made by man, it had become a perverse but substantially accurate self-portrait. Such was the implication of Francis Picabia's work and of Marcel Duchamp's.
The machine, as Picabia put it in one of his titles, is the daughter born without a mother, a modern counterpart to the virgin birth in which Christ, the son, was born without a father. Machinery parodied both sex and religion. It contained limitless possibilities for giving offence, which Picabia was born to do. Picabia was one of those men, almost a modernist invention in themselves, who was locked in a struggle with the very idea of art. He wanted to laugh the notion of painting to death. He had a very strong sense of myth and he couldn't find another outlet for it. The myth was that of the machine as man's counterpart. It obsessed Picabia. It was his main amusement. He married rich and he bought one fast car after another as though he were trying to turn himself into a mechanical centaur. It was also the theme of his art, the body as machine. In 1914, he painted an enormous image of a sexual encounter with a dancer called I See Again in Memory, My Dear Udni. The 19th century novelist Joris Huisman foresaw it in a way when he wrote, Look at the machine, the play of pistons in the cylinders. They are steel Romeos inside cast iron Juliets. The ways of human expression are in no way different to the back and forth of our machines. This is a law to which one must pay homage unless one is either impotent or a saint. Picabio was neither. He had a flair for the old in-out. Mechanical sex, mechanical self. No wonder Picabio's machine portrait still looks so very sardonic. The machine is amoral. Its movements are programmed. It can only act, and nobody wants to be compared to a mechanical slave. Marcel Duchamp would push the machine metaphor even further. Before giving up art for chess, Duchamp had played with every existing art movement and predicted a number of those to come. Well, when you are 15 and uh, paint like the Impressionists, they, you experimenting with yourself, so to speak. You don't know what you're going to do. You don't know even that you are going to do anything else. It took me 10 years or more to change the style, or at least to say, well, there's nothing more in the Impressionists to find. And I tried to find something else. The first went through Fauvism, I went through Cubism, and then it's only in 1912 or 13 that I found more or less what I wanted to do, which would not be influenced by movements that I'd been through, you see. The nude descending a staircase is one of the half dozen most famous paintings of our century. It's a transcription of movement based, again, on Marais' photographs. As cubism, it's quite academic. When the American press saw it, it was seized on as a supreme joke. But the cubists themselves, back in Paris, were not amused. When I came with my new descending staircase, they didn't see that it applied to their theory. It was not an illustration of their theory. And in fact, it had more than cubism had, that is the idea of movement, which the futurists had at the same time. So they thought it was too much, either neither one, nor futurist, nor cubism, and they condemned it. But it did open up the way to Duchamp's most influential work, the large glass, which he left unfinished after eight years. Like the nude, the glass treated the body as a mechanical object. Why on glass? Duchamp explained. Because the trans mainly the transparency of the glass. I wanted to, I've, I had always noticed that the trouble with an oil painting and easel painting is you never know how to do the, the background. You make a portrait or you make some scene or some still life and then comes the background. What are you going to do in the background? You put something in the background and it always falls, or at least very seldom justified. It's just a filling up canvas. With a glass, you don't have to do that. The glass is trans transparent and you put anything behind you wish and you change it every day if you wish as well. And that was for me an element of novelty to convince me I could go on. There's also some kind of literary part to it. 
how it was intended to have every item on the glass, every little design on the glass, explained with a lang with the language, with language, with words. If there was nothing spontaneous about it, which of course is a great objection on the part of aestheticians. They want the, the subconscious to speak by itself. I don't, I don't care. And it was the opposite in that way. So at the end of eight years, even unf not finished, I stopped to, I decided to stop. So what is this thing? Well, it's a machine, but we'd be better off calling it a project for an unfinished contraption that could never be built because its use was never clear, because in turn it parodies the language and the forms of science without the slightest regard for scientific probability or cause or effect. Supposing that an engineer were to use this thing as a blueprint, he'd be in deep trouble because the large glass is never explicit and looked at from the point of view of technical systems, it's simply absurd. The notes that Duchamp left to go with it are the most scrambled instruction manual that you can imagine, but they're deliberately scrambled. For instance, he talked about the thing running on a mythical fuel of his own invention called love gasoline, which passed through filters into feeble cylinders which activated a desire motor, none of which would really have meant very much to Henry Ford. But this is a meta-machine that takes us away from the real world of machinery into that of allegory, with the naked bride up there perpetually disrobing herself in the top half, and down below the poor little bachelors in their empty jackets endlessly grinding away, signalling their frustration to the girl above them. In fact, this thing is an allegory of profane love, which Marcel Duchamp would have us believe is the only sort that is left in the 20th century. Its real text was written by Sigmund Freud in The Interpretation of Dreams, published in 1900. The imposing mechanism of the male sexual apparatus, said Freud, lends itself to symbolization by every sort of indescribably complicated machinery. But the male mechanism of the large glass is not imposing at all. The bachelors are just uniforms, like marionettes. According to Duchamp's notes, they try to indicate their desire to the bride by making the chocolate grinder turn, and it grinds out an imaginary milky stuff like semen, which squirts up through those rings, but can't get into the bride's half of the glass because of that bar. And so the bride is condemned always to tease, and the bachelor's fate is endless masturbation. In one sense, the bride stripped bear is a glimpse into hell, a peculiarly modernist hell of repetition and loneliness. But you could also see it as a declaration of freedom, if you recall the crushing taboos against masturbation that were in force when Duchamp was young. It was the symbol of rebellion against one's parents, and to that extent, the large glass is a free machine, or at least a defiant machine. But it was also a sad machine a testament to indifference, that emotion of which Duchamp was the master. When the large glass was broken in its crate while being shipped, how did he feel? Nothing, not much. I was, uh, well, no, I was not, because I'm fatalist, maybe, enough to take anything as it comes along. And fortunately, a little later, when I look at the brakes, I love the brakes. It happened to be that two, two panes, glass panes, on top of one another, with paints on it, holding a bit. When they break on the vibration of being transported flat, you see, on a, on a, a truck, the, the brakes take a similar uh, direction in the two panes. So when you put them on top of one another, they seem to continue the same, the same brakes as though I had it done in purpose. Duchamp's finely tuned indifference is one of the divides between the late machine age and the time in which we live. The large glass was a long way from the optimism and the sense of possibility with which greater painters but less sophisticated men than Duchamp greeted the machine in those long lost days before World War I. For machinery was now turned on its inventors and their children. After 40 years of continuous peace in Europe, 
The worst war in history cancelled the faith in good technology. The myth of the future went into shock and European art moved into its years of irony, disgust and protest.